Good Monday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Stephen Romo in for Savannah today. Right now on Morning News Now, bracing for impact in the Gulf of Mexico as Ian strengthens into a hurricane overnight. A state of emergency has been declared in Florida by Governor Ron DeSantis ahead of the hurricane's possible landfall later this week. He's urging residents to prepare for the worst. The closer you are to where the eye of the storm makes landfall, uh, anticipate power outages. That is something that will likely to happen uh, with a hurricane of this magnitude. Anticipate uh, fuel disruptions. This morning, we're tracking the path of the hurricane, which now has Cuba in its crosshairs. Back in the spotlight, the January 6th committee's latest public hearing is set for Wednesday. What to expect from that as new allegations emerge about what allegedly went down in the White House on the day of the Capitol riots. Plus, the latest on the Senate battle to push through a last-minute funding bill to avoid a government shutdown by the end of the week. Iran's president vows to deal decisively with violent protests that continue to sweep the country as Iranians vent their anger at the death of a young woman in police custody, the latest as the deadly demonstrations grow throughout the country. And a meteoric rise. It's been 10 years since basketball star Jeremy Lin took the NBA by storm. Now, as a new HBO documentary is looking back at how he shot to fame and the so-called Lin sanity that swept the nation, we've got Lin and the film's director coming up later in the show. A lot going on on this Monday morning. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah, a little Lin sanity in a Monday morning for you. <laughs> yeah, lots of Lin sanity. Can't wait for that one. But we do begin this morning with the latest on Ian. Getting stronger overnight, now growing to a Category 1 hurricane with winds of 75 miles per hour. Ian is in the Caribbean Sea now, and hurricane warnings are posted for Grand Cayman as well as western Cuba, where hurricane force winds, flash flooding, and storm surges are likely. Ian is expected to make landfall along the Florida Gulf Coast later this week, and people throughout the state are bracing for impact. All weekend long, they've been stocking up on food, water, and gas, and preparing sandbags ahead of the storm. Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency for the entire state of Florida, and President Biden approved an emergency declaration over the weekend. Local leaders are telling people not to wait. Now is the time to get prepared. As we've all seen, this storm is unpredictable. Don't rely on just the main forecast line and don't be complacent. Make sure you know your emergency plan and your hurricane supply kits are prepared. We're covering the storm's latest developments from all angles. We're going to begin with NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber in Tampa, Florida. So, Ellison, we know there's a lot of uncertainty this far out about exactly where Ian is going to make landfall, but we just heard that official urging people take this seriously. How are people in Tampa preparing right now? Yeah, I mean, look, for better or worse, Floridians are used to this, and they are preparing accordingly. This Home Depot, they just got in a new shipment of a bunch of gas canisters, generators, and even just cases and cases of water. There's been a steady flow of people. You can see this guy over here grabbing a generator and two gas cans coming in to get stocked up in the event that they need these supplies. That's really the main message we're hearing from officials right now is to get prepared now. Make sure you have everything you need in the event event that you need it. Don't wait because there's a lot of potential here, even though there is still uncertainty that you could see a lot of rain, high winds, storm surge, and that people need to do everything they can now so that they're in a position to deal with it when that hurricane eventually hits land here. Listen to what some people have said. They again are all saying what we hear so often from Floridians. They've been here before, but they're preparing just in case. Listen. If you're staying home, try to ride it out. You definitely want to fill up your water, your, your tub with water. And um, just be prepared and listen to all the alerts. And if you're told to evacuate, make sure you get out. I don't think we should panic. I don't think, uh, you know, it's part of living here in Florida. Um, we should always definitely be prepared for the worst, of course, but not panic. Really just came for a generator. You know, no, no gas in Florida makes living difficult if you don't have electricity. One other thing officials have said in recent press conferences, they're urging people to not get too wedded to some of the models that they're seeing where it shows the specific cone and the specific dots because they say there's a wide range of where this storm could go and that the impacts could be broadly felt across Florida. So they really want everyone in every county, all 67 of them, to be prepared. 
Stephen, Joe. Always good advice, Ellis. And so we know the governor declared a state of emergency. The president quickly approved uh, that on the federal level. What sort of resources does that provide the state as they prepare for this? Yeah, I mean, that's all about another step of being prepared, right? It frees up money earlier so that if counties, if people say, hey, we need extra things here, there for resources, particularly after uh, the storm has kind of made its way out, that they have access to the funding that they need. It also uh, moves the National Guard on to standby. Uh, everybody is sort of in this prepare stage, and that includes the federal as well as the state government. So that's what we're seeing as they're issuing some of these declarations, orders early so that they they and their teams can be in positions to respond as needed. One of the things that they're doing here uh, at the state level, according to uh, some of the emergency managers in this state, is that they are pre-positioning supplies in the event counties call saying they need it. So they have over 360 trailers filled with some 2 million plus meals and over a million gallons of water in the event one of their counties calls them and says, hey, we need those supplies and we need them now. They're already loaded up on a trailer in a staging area ready to go. Joe, Stephen. Right. Allison Barber, and something tells me all of those gas canisters and water supplies behind you will be greatly depleted the next time we see you later on today. Mm -hmm. Allison, thank you yes. so much. Mm -hmm. Well, joining us now with more on this is Ann Bink. She's the Assistant Administrator for Response and Recovery at FEMA. Ann, good morning. Thanks for being here. So, Ian, now a Category 1 hurricane likely to grow stronger in the coming days before it may hit Florida later this week. So, if you could give us an update on what FEMA is doing right now to help people ahead of the storm. Hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, as, as the reporter mentioned, right now we are working to pre-position commodities and supplies, things like food, water, generator support, as well as pre-positioning our specialized teams to ensure that we can respond quickly uh, post landfall. You know, what we're looking at now is the cone is wide and impacts will be felt outside of that cone. So to reiterate what we've just heard, it's very important that folks have an evacuation plan, have a readiness plan and execute that plan. And then yesterday, Governor Ron DeSantis had this to say about the potential effects of Ian on Florida. Let's listen. It's important to point out to folks that the path of this is still uncertain. The impacts will be broad throughout the state of Florida. Anticipate power outages. That is something that will likely to happen uh, with a hurricane of this magnitude. Anticipate uh, fuel disruptions. So we hear him talking about power outages and fuel disruptions. What plans should people be taking now to make sure they have what they're going to need to stay safe? Absolutely. With the rapid intensification of this storm, it is highly likely there will be power outages upon and even possibly before landfall. It's very important to go to ready.gov and make your plans. It's also important to download the FEMA app where you can get emergency alerts uh, and warnings. Listen to your local officials. If they urge evacuation, heed those warnings. This is a very large and powerful storm system that will not only drive heavy rains and storm surge, uh, but also dangerous winds. And you mentioned evacuations. From what we could tell right now, do you expect that people will be asked to evacuate? So know your zones. Those decisions will be made at the local level. Uh, so pay attention to your local officials. Uh, make sure you're ready. Uh, the best thing to do right now is also to be linked up with your friends, family, your neighbors, folks that will need extra time to potentially move out or have additional needs at home. Make sure you're checking on them. Make sure you have an extra key for their house that you know where their medications are. And Florida's leaning into this. They've uh, set up a website called floridadisaster.org. Uh, if you have med medical needs that require electricity with your med medical equipment, or you have medications that require refrigeration, please register so the state knows where you are and local officials do so we can respond to your needs post landfall. Some important tips there. And moving forward after the storm hits, we saw how wide that cone is. What resources will be available to help people recover from the potential effects of Ian? And depending on the effects, you know, sheltering may be necessary. You can also find that in the FEMA.gov app. Uh, but just make sure you're, you're keeping aware, keeping alert, and checking on each other throughout the storm. Uh, and we'll, again, all those pre-positioned resources and teams uh, I spoke about earlier will all be available uh, to bring, bring to bear with the, with the state. I want to say, too, Florida's really leaning into their preparedness here, and we stand in lockstep with them. Hoping for the best here, but preparation is so key. And Bink, thank you so much. Thank you. A lot of folks keeping an eye on the weather. So are we as Hurricane Ian approaches. Yes, uh, NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with more on Ian. Good morning, Michelle.
Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And we're going to be watching Ian very closely this week. It's going to be really until Thursday night, Friday, where we see that landfall. So as of the latest advisory, it is now a hurricane, a Category 1 hurricane at 75 miles per hour. It is 90 uh, miles south of Grand Cayman, and we're seeing those impacts on the island there, moving northwest at 14 miles per hour. So first, it will impact Grand Cayman today and then eventually impacting Cuba later on today. We do have tropical alerts, many of them hurricane warning that is in the red. For the western portion of Cuba, we have a tropical storm warning, too, for central Cuba. A tropical storm warning is posted for the Keys. And then look at parts of southwestern uh, Florida. We're looking at a hurricane watch. That is in pink. And yellow is a tropical storm watch. So we're getting prepared here, like Ann mentioned. They're leaning into it. This is going to be a tough go for them as we go throughout this week. So let's look at the track here. We're looking by uh, Tuesday morning, just 24 hours from now, a little less than that. We're looking at a Category 3 storm. So we do expect this to blossom. It's going to rapidly intensify as it approaches Cuba. It's going to be tough there. We're going to have life-threatening mudslides, life-threatening landslides, life-threatening storm surge, really heavy rainfall, up to 16 inches in some cases, and hurricane force winds. Then it's going to enter the Gulf. It's going to slow down and widen. We're going to see a Category 4 storm by Wednesday morning, remaining a Category 4 storm for quite some time. So notice that cone of concern sort of touching the peninsula of Florida. We could feel those impacts as early as late Tuesday, Wednesday into the peninsula of Florida. Key West, you're going to feel that later on tonight into Tuesday. So now is the time to prepare. If you didn't get the plywood, you didn't get the gas, you didn't get the water, you need to do that today because that window is closing. Then as we go out Thursday into Friday, that's where we expect the landfall. We do expect it to weaken somewhat. It's going to encounter some drier air, some wind shear, but still a really strong storm. And notice that cone. We've been talking about this how it sort of widens out. Still really uncertain because we're four or five days out from this, where that landfall is going to be. So the takeaway is when you see a cone like this, where you see that line, there's an equal opportunity for that landfall to be occurring on that line. And it is wide. So anywhere from the Panhandle of Florida, the Big Bend of Florida, down to the Peninsula of Florida, north, central, even southern Florida could see an impact. And we're, then we're going to still see tropical storm force winds as it enters into the southwest. And Carolinas, you're going to get a lot of rain as well, too. Storm surge alert. Storm surge alerts. This is a big one. Storm surge is a wall of water as it moves on shore. On the west coast of Florida, especially around Tampa, it is tough to get that water back out. So we are concerned for this. Where you see the purple, that is your storm surge watches. We're looking anywhere up to five to eight feet of storm surge. That includes Tampa, four to seven. A little further down the Keys, you're going to see one to three feet. A lot of rainfall is expected as well, up to 10 inches in some spots, even locally up to 15 inches. Some of this soil is sandy. It can accept some of that water, but that is still a lot of water. It's going to be raining for days and days as we're going to feel that impact early by the middle of the week through at least Saturday, at least through the weekend. And we're looking at the winds as well. Remember that ground is going to be really saturated. Trees are going to come down. Power lines are going to come down. We're going to see those power outages. Real quick, we're looking at heavy rain today in the Great Lakes, showers and storms in the in Florida, and we're looking at record heat too in the West. Back to you guys. Right, yeah, with the hurricane, rain, wind, storm surge, so many things to keep an eye on. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. Well, the focus is on Ian this morning, but the cleanup is still ongoing from the damage caused by Fiona. In Puerto Rico, about half of the island is still without power one week after Fiona made landfall there. And they're just beginning to clean up in Canada after the storm hit this weekend, causing extensive damage there. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the latest from Nova Scotia. A daunting recovery along Canada's east coast. A task so massive, the Canadian Armed Forces called in to help. People have seen their homes washed away, seen the winds rip schools, roofs off. But as Canadians, as we always do in times of difficulty, we will be there for each other. The strongest storm ever to slam the nation, post-tropical cyclone Fiona brought wind gusts up to 100 miles an hour and torrential floods, decimating parts of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island and beyond. Entire homes swept to sea. One woman still missing. Power knocked out for half a million. Amid these massive power outages, this is one of three working gas stations in all of hard-hit Pictou County. And look at this line. People are waiting more than four hours to fill up. Are you relieved just to see a working gas station? I am, yeah. We have a generator at home, so I'm just anxious to get that gas so we can get it up and running. Up and down Canada's coast, countless evacuees desperate to see what's left of the lives they knew. You cannot go to your homes now. Unfortunately, this is going to take days, could take weeks, could take months. Meanwhile, Fiona's overall death count rising. 18 killed so far. 
Most in Puerto Rico, where more than 800,000 remain without power a week after Fiona hit. And back here in Trenton, in Nova Scotia, this is what progress in the cleanup process looks like. Mangled roofing and siding that was just piled up here by local construction crews. And for reference, officials don't think stuff like this is bad enough to warrant sending Canada's military to this area. They see them going to regions that were even harder hit. Back to you. All right, Maggie Vespa in Canada. Maggie, thank you. Turning now to the latest on the January 6th investigation and a big week ahead. That's right. The House committee investigating the attack on the Capitol will hold its next public hearing on Wednesday, possibly the final public hearing before the midterms. NBC News reporter Julie Serkin joins us now with more on this. Julie, good morning to you. First, if you could walk us through what we should expect to hear from the committee on Wednesday. Yeah, good morning to you both. Well, first of all, we don't have any witness list or a topic for Wednesday's hearing, uh, but panel members were all over the Sunday shows yesterday, sort of previewing what to come and what to expect in this potentially final hearing, right? Adam Schiff, a member of the committee, said that is the plan unless they have uh, some sort of other revelations uh, that come after the fact. But this right now plans to be the last one. And they still have a lot to show in terms of how former President Trump uh, did, in fact, what his actions were on the day of January 6th, but why it took him so long to call up the riot, sort of these details uh, that were illustrated in the first eight hearings. But the committee says they still have a lot to display and facts to show. We know they've been busy over the last two months since the eighth hearing, the last one that took place in July, interviewing other witnesses, hearing uh, from people and securing cooperation, including from Ginny Thomas, uh, who the panel expects to interview soon. We do not know yet at this point if she will be a part of Wednesday's testimony or not. Julie, we also heard some new claims about what was allegedly happening at the White House on the day of the attack. Let's take a listen to what former GOP congressman, former committee staffer Denver Ringelman told 60 Minutes last night. Do you get a real aha moment when you see that the White House switchboard had connected to a rioter's phone while it's happening? That's a big, pretty big aha moment. You get an aha. Wait a minute. Someone in the White House was calling one of the rioters while the riot was going on? On January 6th. Absolutely. So it's important to note that it's not clear who placed the call or whether they were even in a position of authority. But Julie, how does this account by Riggleman fit into the evidence that the committee has already laid out? And bottom line, how significant is it if it's true? Well, look, the first thing I should point out is that Denver Riggleman left the committee in April. So it's been a very long time since he's had sort of the inside scoop as to what the committee is working on. And we heard from Adam Schiff yesterday, who responded to this basically in real time. He said, look, we looked into every single allegation that Riggleman and others provided. There is a reason we did not mention this yet. And he sort of threw cold water on this idea. He said, I cannot say whether this in detail is true or not, but just big picture to kind of, uh, you know, have a realistic picture of Riggleman's uh, sort of in sort of uh, idea of the committee. He hasn't been with them for some time. Uh, he has a book coming out tomorrow. We know the committee isn't super thrilled about that. So we don't know exactly whether Riggleman's claim uh, holds any water, but Schiff certainly threw cold water on it yesterday. And Julie, just about 30 seconds left here, but we're also keeping an eye on the potential government shutdown that could happen at the end of the week if the lawmakers can't agree on this temporary funding bill. What are some hurdles to that bill? Look, the big picture is there's no alarm bells ringing now. There's no one concerned, Republican or Democrat, that the government actually will shut down simply because we are weeks away from the midterm election and in this current economy, there is no appetite for something like that to happen, but there are some real hurdles. We know, first of all, $12 billion in Ukraine aid is set to be a part of this, including disaster aid. We just heard from sources this morning, Ford Jackson, Mississippi, the water crisis, and things of that nature in the U.S. One big hang-up right now is over permitting reform. Senator Manchin's proposal that Democrats, like Bernie Sanders says, goes against what climate groups want. Uh, it speeds up the permit approval process for drilling uh, for oil, including the Mountain Valley pipe Pipeline in West Virginia. Republicans, not sure if they want to support that either after Manchin's deal with Democrats to pass the Inflation Reduction Act in the summer. So we'll see what happens tomorrow when they come back. Yeah, the midterms change that calculus. Julie Serkin, thank you. Coming up, a new warning from Iran's president. Yeah, he's pledging to deal decisively with violent protests in the country over a week ago following the death of a woman in police custody. The latest on that crackdown coming up next.
Welcome back. Government officials in Iran continue to violently crack down on the growing number of protests sweeping the country. Those demonstrations follow the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini. Iran's president is pledging to, quote, deal decisively with those who oppose the country's security and tranquility. State media is reporting at least 41 people have been killed since the protests began over a week ago. NBC News has not confirmed this number. The death of Amini sparked anger in Iran. She was arrested on September September 13th for allegedly violating the country's strictly enforced Islamic dress code. Police say she died from a pre-existing condition and had a heart attack while in custody, but her family has since disputed that claim. An investigation into her death is underway. Let's bring in Nagar Mordazavi for more on this. She is an Iranian-American journalist and an analyst and host of the Iran podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. So a state-run newspaper is reporting that Iran's interior minister Minister also called on the judiciary to take legal action against protest leaders that would, quote, teach them a lesson. How concerned are you that we're going to see more of an escalation here? Well, Joe, this is more recipe for a violent crackdown, as we've seen in past protests, namely in November 2019. Before that, another large round of protests in 2009, the Green Movement. Um, what we saw was state use a lot of uh, violence on the streets, security forces directly shooting at people, uh, using, as the UN is calling it, unnecessary and severe violence, and in order to, as they call it, wrap up the protesters and send them back home. So we've already heard reports of dozens of protesters killed on the street. The exact number is not confirmed. It's still coming in. There is disruptions to the Internet, access to social media. There's also rounds of arrests of journalists, of prominent activists, and also threats from security forces. I have talked to some who receive phone calls essentially telling them to tone it down online and uh, threatening them to be arrested if they continue. So I think a crackdown um, is we're already witnessing it from the images on the street, and I think it will become even more violent. I want to ask you more about the Internet. I mean, Iranian officials say they will not allow Internet access in parts of the country until the protests have stopped. International human rights groups are worried a lack of Internet is going to make it harder to track potential human rights violations. H help us understand, what role is the Internet playing here, and are uh, Iranians able to circumvent the Internet block at all? Well, Iranian users are actually very savvy in utilizing the Internet in general, messaging uh, apps, social media. To uh, blocking the Internet, one aim is to limit protesters from organizing, from communicating with, with each other on the street. Another aim is to prevent them from disseminating the information that they're out there to the rest of the country, because when people hear that there's a big protest in a place in their city, they can go and join it. But if they don't, then they won't. And then also to prevent them from sending out images, videos, photos, eyewitness accounts of what's happening on the street, as you said, human rights abuses, and just the severity um, of the crackdown. So all of these are the steps that the government has been taking in the past. In 2019, there was a near total shutdown. Yes, some users still try to circumvent. They use proxies. They use VPNs. Um, but just in general, it becomes very difficult. Internet becomes very slow, and just information trickles uh, out uh, until much later, weeks and weeks and months and months after protests, um, information gets out of the country. Nagar Mordazabi, thank you so much for your expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. To Russia now, where more than 800 people were arrested this past weekend, they were protesting Russian President Vladimir Putin's new military draft order for the fight against Ukraine. And now with men of military age fleeing the country, there are new fears Putin could try to stop them. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the latest from Kharkiv, Ukraine. Amidst the outrage, brutality and fear triggered by Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to force hundreds of thousands of ordinary Russians to the front lines. As the Ukrainian president accuses Putin of nuclear blackmail, the U.S. is issuing this warning. If Russia crosses this line, there will be catastrophic consequences for Russia. The United States will respond decisively. Thousands have taken to the streets across Russia to protest mobilization. Hundreds of Siberian women encircled police officers screaming no to genocide and demanding peace. As the country's men try to dodge potential draft orders any way they can. This man fled to Finland. I'm afraid to be mobilized. I don't want 
to, to participate in this war. So I decided to uh, escape. And in the Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine, what the West calls a sham referendum. And the local population terrified that should Russia illegally annex their cities, they too could be forced to the front lines to fight against their homeland. NBC has spoken to one person living in occupied Kherson, who describes total fear and panic. Everyone is planning their way out, they say, though men aged 18 to 35 are not being allowed to leave, adding that the city has been transformed into a large ghetto. Anything you do might lead to you dying and maybe your friends dying. They say the men are looking for places to hide. Over the weekend, President Putin signed a new law, essentially making desertion or failure to show up for military service punishable by up to 10 years in prison. This as President Zelensky addressing the Russian people this weekend directly in Russia, urging them to surrender if they're part of this partial mobilization, saying they will be treated fairly by Ukraine, saying that it's better to surrender than to be tried as a war criminal. Back to you. All right, Aaron, thank you. To Italy now, where far-right nationalist Giorgia Maloney is on course to become the country's next prime minister as election results come in. She'll be Italy's first woman leader and signal the country's most right-wing government since World War II. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with more on these elections. Claudio, good morning to you. So Maloney, considered to be a far-right nationalist in Italy and her Brothers of Italy party, has roots in Italy's post-war fascist movement. So what else should we know about about her and how did she pull this off? Good morning, Stephen. Well, she's relatively young. She's only 45, but she's been in politics almost forever, as far as we know. I mean, she was a very young activist. Uh, as a young uh, political activist, she was the leader of a youth movement of a post-fascist party founded by a former member of the fascist party. And she never hid uh, her sympathy, her appreciation of fascism and Benito Mussolini. At some point, when she was this young uh, leader of this youth movement, she said, that uh, she thought that no politician uh, until now has been as good as Benito Mussolini. She's toned that down now, uh, recently, of course, during uh, the past few weeks during the political campaign, saying that she and her party have relegated fascism to the history uh, books. But it's not just her past convictions that are worrying certain analysts around here and abroad. It's her present uh, policies. Uh, she is leading a far-right uh, policy, which is very much in line with other uh, movements around Europe, like with Viktor Orban in Hungary or Marine Le Pen in France, the uh, National Front, or Vox in Spain. Not coincidentally, they uh, have congratulated her uh, first for this very historic, let's say, win, because as you mentioned, uh, she uh, is uh, leading the most far-right government in Italy since the end of the Second World War, Stephen. Making headlines for several reasons, Claudio, including, as we mentioned, Maloney is the first woman to hold the prime minister title in Italy. So what does that mean for the country? Well, that's right. I mean, but the thing is that for those women who thought that the fact that she could become Italy's uh, prime, first female prime minister would raise the profile of women in Italy, well, they probably would have been disappointed yesterday when on TikTok during election day, she posted a video of herself showing two melons in front of her breasts. Now, let me explain that. Uh, Meloni means melons in Italian, which is, of course, also street language for breasts. Well, that was have been disappointing because you know that doesn't do any good to the objectification of women uh, here in Italy as she was objectifying herself essentially also during the political campaign she said something interesting about abortion she said that she wanted to introduce the right of women not not to give abortion which may sound weird because obviously women in Italy have the right to give birth as well as uh, to give abortion but some have interpreted that as she wants to make it more difficult for women uh, to give abortion or at least uh, discourage them from doing so, Stephen. Many dynamics at play here. Claudio Lavanga, thank you for that update. Coming up, hard knocks. Some conservative-leaning canvassing groups under fire this morning over their alleged hostile door-to-door -door tactics. How they're reportedly operating and how it could all affect the upcoming midterm elections. That's coming up next.
Welcome back. Across the country, complaints are growing about conservative canvassing groups going door to door looking for potential evidence of fraud in former President Donald Trump's 2020 election loss. While the grassroots effort is scrutinizing local election procedures across the country. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now with more on this. Good morning, Dasha. Hey, Stephen, good morning. Yeah, canvassers claiming they're helping clean up voter rolls have been knocking on doors in at least 11 states. These grassroots groups have raised concerns among election officials, civil rights groups, even the Department of Justice. To learn more, we traveled to Washington state, where county auditors have received complaints of canvassers becoming hostile, telling voters they work for state or county elections offices, even displaying fake badges. Washington Secretary of State calling it voter intimidation. <laughs> Spokane mom Catherine Teske says two visitors with an aggressive tone rang her doorbell earlier this year. She says they told her they were there to make sure no one had voted fraudulently. I felt insulted, but I also felt angry because it's like I felt like we weren't being trusted and we couldn't figure out why. Like what about us makes us suspicious voters? The visits came amid a massive door knocking effort organized by the Washington Voter Research Project. Glenn Morgan, a conservative activist, saying he founded the organization last year to clean up the state's voter rolls. We have about 350 volunteers in the state, and it's pretty widespread. Of the 39 counties, we have about 23 of them with uh, doorbelling teams. Morgan says the goal is to help local auditors who run elections in each Washington county. But some, like Vicki Dalton, argue this effort isn't helpful. In fact, they've received complaints from residents about canvassers' tactics. One of the gentlemen would flash what a person described as a fakey metal badge. Does it seem like these people were trying to imply that they were affiliated with your office? People were representing themselves as either doing this for the Secretary of State or doing it for that particular county auditor's office. A complaint to Vancouver area officials stated that a canvasser, quote, claimed everyone in the building needed to fill out a form or their votes would retroactively be purged from recent elections. As more counties reported complaints, Secretary of State Steve Hobbs launched an outreach campaign to tell voters they don't need to answer canvassers' questions. No county auditor, no county government, no, not the Secretary of State's office would ever go to your house to find out how you voted or if you're a voter, we would never do that. We've received multiple reports that some of the people who are canvassing are implying that they're with the county or with the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? I'm aware of three instances like that across the state. Uh, and some of them are repeats of the same story that are just circulating all the time. And every time we've looked down to it, there hasn't been any merit from the overall claim. When the group said it had found almost 2,000 suspicious voter records in Thurston County, Auditor Mary Hall's team investigated. We went through every single record. Were there any anomalies, irregularities, anything illegal happening? Not a single one. Out of 1,900? Out of 1,941. Concerns about similar groups have popped up in at least 11 states. And a New Mexico canvassing effort is now the subject of a U.S. House Oversight Committee investigation for spreading disinformation and intimidating voters. This is part of a greater threat on our elections and our very democracy. We saw what happened in January 6th in our nation's capital. What this does is when you go to door to door like this and put out a false narrative, you erode the integrity of the elections. And Stephen, we just learned that about a week ago, Catherine Teske, the voter you met early in the piece, received a letter from the Washington Voter Research Project thanking her for her participation in this, quote, very first step to try to achieve cleaner voter rolls and claiming that their report shows the rolls are not clean. Catherine told us the letter seemed like an attempt to make their harassment of her household seem legitimate. Stephen? Certainly more to come on that one. Dasha, thank you. As part of Hispanic Heritage Month, we're shining a light on two entrepreneurs who are harnessing the power of their culture. NBC Nightly News Saturday anchor Jose diaz Balart met the women behind the JZD brand. Yay! Inside this warehouse in Brownsville, Texas, it's like vanilla on chocolate. Jen Serrano and Veronica Vasquez are creating something special. Inspired by their culture, the couple is designing caps, t-shirts, and hoodies, all with slogans splashed across in Spanish. Words of empowerment like poderosa, meaning powerful, and Latina power, 
One, two, but three. for these partners in business and in life, their company, JZD, is about so much more than just clothes. Talk to me about what is being a Latino or Latina. It's the core of who we are. My parents sacrificed so much to get me here. And now they get to see me living out this dream. That American dream started across the border from Brownsville with parents who emigrated from Mexico. Jen was broke when she started the online business in 2016, but it took off after celebrities like Zoe Saldana, Eva Longoria, and Jessica Alba were spotted wearing their designs. That led to the couple's big break. Retail giant Target came calling, and this month it started stocking JZD's merchandise. Tell me about that time that you both first walked into a Target and saw your T-shirts on there. There was a lot of tears. <laughs> So we had a mariachi. To see everybody come in to shop the products and then to see their reaction, that was tears for days. Now the mission is a family affair with Jennifer's mom and dad pitching in. The team's success, a victory for all. <laughs> what is it you think about our cultural roots that makes us who we are? Our parents, they had to work and sacrifice so much for us. And I think that the biggest gift that they give us is the things that they taught us to be honest, to be hardworking, to show up as ourselves always. And that authenticity, I think, is what has gotten us so far in this business. Our thanks to Jose Diaz Ballard for that great report. JZD reported more than $2 million in sales in under six years, shipping to more than 31 countries. Now they're looking to expand, working on a housewares line. Pretty cool. Very cool. Well, coming up, prepared for questioning. Tesla CEO Elon Musk gets ready to face off with Twitter lawyers over his abandoned takeover bid for the social media company. What we can expect from that highly anticipated deposition next. Lawyers from Twitter are set to question Elon Musk under oath in a deposition this week. It's part of the fallout over his $44 billion acquisition. Yeah, Musk scrapped his bid to buy the company in the summer, and that led Twitter to sue Musk to try to force him to follow through with that deal. More on this, let's bring in Addie Robertson, a senior reporter for The Verge, and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Good morning to both of you. Addie, let's begin with you. This deposition expected to take two days, maybe three days if necessary. What's expected to take place? What information is Twitter trying to get from Musk here? The basic thing that Twitter is trying to get from Musk is an admission that either a, he already understood the scope of the bot problem on Twitter and that he's really not worried about bots. He got cold feet in the deal and they're trying to dig up information that suggests that there were other reasons why he would have put it on hold. And Danny, let's bring you here to this conversation. We know that Musk is saying that Twitter's not being upfront about the number of bots and fake accounts they have. What standing does Musk have there, and how does Twitter respond? Well, first, this deposition, I can't believe it's only predicted to last two days. This could be a four-day deposition with all of the information. Believe me, Twitter's lawyers have their pencils sharpened, stacks of exhibits to show Musk. And the key will be, what did you know? And when did you know it about bots? What were your expectations going into this deal? And if you say those were your expectations, show us the receipts. Show us the documents, the emails, everything else that made it reasonable for you to say uh, that you did your due diligence and this bot problem was something that was unanticipated. Uh, although it's a lot more complicated than that, in a way, it can be boiled down to that simple inquiry. And the thing about a deposition, we don't see them often in movies. They're not sexy, but they are quietly where all the work gets done in a civil case. Civil cases are won or lost at the deposition. And this is the biggest opponent, dollar-wise, arguably, in the history of depositions. All right, Addy, uh, in a court filing earlier this month, Musk accused Twitter of fraud. This after a whistleblower testified before Congress, alleging security vulnerabilities, oversights at the company. Twitter said the claims are without merit. Does that factor into this week's deposition? And if so, how? One of the things that Twitter has requested that it hasn't formally gotten yet is information about, as you said, what Musk knew and when he knew it about the whistleblower claims. So it's possible that it's going to question Musk about 
whether he was aware of this information and whether possibly they have argued that, yeah, these claims are without merit, that they really are completely specious, and he'll likely get questioned about that. And Danny, what's next following this deposition? And what movement should we expect leading up to that trial that's expected to start next month? Here's what usually happens to me after I take someone's deposition. I make a list of all the things that I learned during the deposition that, hey, you never provided us that document. I demand those documents. And then as to all the things that Musk says, oh, yeah, I put that somewhere in some document. I put a follow-up request for those documents as well. So the deposition can often beget more depositions, more discovery. But the catch here is that this is not a case where you have two or three years to wait for trial. This thing's moving on the rocket docket. So uh, after this deposition, the work has only just begun. And they don't have a lot of time to do it. So they got to get all their discovery done and figure out if there's anybody else out there that they need to ask questions under oath. We're all taking a ride on the rocket docket. <laughs> I like that, right? Yeah, Andy Savalos, Andy Robertson, thank you both. Appreciate it. Well, more business headlines now. Amazon has announced the dates for its second Prime Day sale of the year. CNBC's Frank Holland joins us with that and other money news. Frank, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Well, Amazon will host Prime Early Access on October 11th and 12th. The event marks the first time that Amazon's held two Prime Day-like deal events in the same year. The event is only open to Amazon Prime subscribers, and it could help Amazon jumpstart holiday shopping early. According to the company, the event will feature hundreds of thousands of holiday deals. Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon, they could be the hardest hit by a new corporate minimum tax, according to a new study from the University of North Carolina Tax Center. Researchers applied the Inflation Reduction Act's 15% minimum corporate tax on a 2021 company earnings. And that study finds the tax would impact only about 78 companies. Among those, Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon would have to pay up the most. And the highest grossing, grossing film of all time is back in theaters. Disney's expected to generate $30 million in ticket sales globally from its theatrical re-release of the 2009 film Avatar. Avatar's return to movie theaters this weekend comes three months ahead of the film's long-delayed sequel, Avatar, The Way of the Water. And you know what? I think I might go back in the theater and see it. I remember the first one was just amazing. Yeah, and that's a good place to see it. That is definitely yeah. a theater movie, and they're trying yeah. to just squeeze a little more box office money <laughs> out of that one. All right. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Well, coming up, we're reliving Lynn's sanity. That's right. A decade after Jeremy Lynn's landmark season with the New York Knicks, a new documentary takes a look back. Jeremy Lynn himself and the film's director join us. So stay with us. It's after this. Welcome back. Rihanna finally broke her social media silence. She told fans she's been drafted for this year's Super Bowl halftime show. The singer made the announcement in this Instagram post showing what appears to be her arm holding a football. It is her first post since she gave birth to her first child back in May. Apple Music, which replaced Pepsi as the halftime show sponsor, confirmed the news. The 2023 Super Bowl will be held at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona, coming up on February 12th. We were just talking about it last week. I predicted yeah. Lizzo. I'm perfectly happy with Rihanna. <laughs> yeah, so many people are. That thing blew up so fast. Brent sent that to me and said, do you think this means she's going to be in the halftime? Um, there's nothing else that can be. Exactly, and so hopefully exciting. new music, too. Oh, yeah. Let's see. All right. It has been 10 years since Jeremy Lin took the NBA by storm as a member of the New York Knicks. His extraordinary run during that season became known as Lin's Sanity. Yeah, that is now the subject of a new HBO documentary film called 38 at the Garden, which debuts October 11th on HBO and HBO Max. Joining us now to talk more about that in the new documentary is Jeremy Lin himself, as well as Frank Chi, who directed that film. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Frank, let's start with you. Explain to us, if you will, this project and how it came together and what your vision was for this documentary. Sure. Uh, thank you for having us. So we really started this process with the idea of talking about impossible moments, right? When is a moment when society at large assigns to a group of people saying, you can't do this, and someone comes out of nowhere and just shatters those stereotypes to pieces? Um, that, to me, is the perfect description of what Linsanity was. You know, Jeremy's story has always meant so much to me because it is the greatest example Asian Americans have of someone who looked at the wall of stereotypes that threatened to define them, and he just saw every crack in that wall. He kept pushing and pushing and pushing until that that wall of stereotypes came crumbling down. Right, and I think you know as we were we're coming to this moment 
today where we're talking about the sudden weaponization of stereotypes against Asian Americans, we thought it was really important for us to revisit Linsanity 10 years later from that context because it can really shed light to a lot of the conversations we're having about Asian American identity right now. I mean, so Jeremy, I mean, first of all, it's hard to believe it's been a decade now since Lynn Sanity took over the NBA. The, the 38 points you scored against the Lakers at the Garden on that February night, that's what put you on the map. What do you remember most about that stretch of games and your time in New York? Uh, honestly, it was a blur. I think it's like kind of when you're in the zone um, where it's like things are happening, but you're not all the way aware, all the way conscious. Like, and it was also the lockout season, so games were coming so fast. But it was, I mean, it was just so surreal to think about like what was actually happening. And and for my, for me myself, sometimes I have to pinch myself. Or when I rewatch Dirty at the Garden or other, other you know past highlights i'll be like dang that really happened um and, and exactly what frank said it's like to look back because i'm not somebody who looks back on it often but to look back 10 years later when you think about where we are today as society and you think about that moment then it makes it even more powerful um to have it within the context of where we are today um, and i think that's what's really cool about looking back and obviously that sheds light into the, the issues of where we are today Really cool to look back. And Frank, who are some of the people we can expect to see in 38 in the Garden? And what are some of the themes you touch on? Uh, sure. So, you know, if I were to describe it without any basketball, I would say that 38 in the Garden is this. It's part one is about stereotypes. Part two is about what happens when Jeremy comes out of nowhere and shatters those stereotypes in front of the whole world. And part three is about today, when those stereotypes have been weaponized, and when they're weaponized, they turn into anti-Asian violence. Right, that was a really hard topics to 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 cover um, in a way that you know factors in entertainment and really like draws an audience in. So a lot of it is you know we do it through comedy, right? Um, there are we have an incredible array of comedians in this movie who are just at the top of their game: Jin Yang, Hassan Menaj, Ronnie Chang. Um, you know, Hassan has a line in the movie that I'll just you know preview that I felt like really encapsulated. He said, you know, if what Jeremy did was possible, then what else is possible? And it's really that note of optimism and hope that we want to remind people of, especially if you're young Asian American today and you look at a society and you say, hey, maybe this one, thing, maybe, maybe I don't belong here, right? Maybe yeah. the messages that people are sending are, 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 mm -hmm. are not what I need to hear. And that's why we need to send that, you know, send that message today. Jeremy, we have like 30 seconds left here. What's your message to people who see this documentary? Uh, my message to people is um, things need to get better, um, for sure. And um, at the same time, we need to hold on to hope. I think that's what this whole thing is about. That's what insanity is. Not just about Asian Americans, not just about minorities, not just about underdogs, it's about all this, it's about everything. And I think we need to face where we are today but we also need to move forward with hope because at the end of the day, what we really want to be doing is we want to be making this place and this world better, um, especially for the next generation. So that's what I would say. This documentary, everything we're trying to do, this whole team is about. A great message. Frank, Jeremy, thank you both so much. And as a reminder, 38 at the Garden debuts October 11th on HBO and HBO Max. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. And your news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.